going to give us a, some information on how to get the best print from your digital image because we're going to have a, um, our show, Photo Magic, and people might want to know how to get a good print. And then we're going to have John Burgess's recording of his uh, Santa Rosa Junior College photography class on food. And then Mike Funk agreed to show his endeavors in food photography. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> So Steve, you want to begin? He's coming. Okay, I'm just about set. Uh, I got to start my video, I think. Mm -hmm. And I've got dancing dots. Yes, you do. Is it contagious? <laughs> Here we go. Okay, now I I can't see what you're seeing. Are you seeing Bay Photo? Bay Photo, yeah. Bay Photo. Okay. Um, I'm just going through very simply how you can get something that you can hang in the exhibition without going into you know fine details and lots of framing options papers all that stuff if you just basically want something that you can act can hang in our exhibition and let's see i want to knock something out of my view here and i use bay photo because i have always gotten excellent results and uh, really good customer service. If there's the slightest problem with the print, they send a whole new one and fix it. So anyway, I always recommend check the current specials because see, for example, they'll give you for a short period of time, 25% off something. So you can get some really good deals if you follow their specials. So, so doing a basic print, generally go to all probably just straight photographic prints and you know, um, they have from wall sizes up to 30 by 120, a lot of different print surfaces. In uh, an exhibition, um, the luster mat, you know, the glossies are going to re reflect a whole lot and be distracting. Um, pearl is nice if you've got um, vivid deep colors. That's also great paper. Protective coatings. Uh, luster is the, the sort of mid gloss, not full gloss. Um, you can get textures that's not going to affect the gallery much. But here's the thing you can get a simple print mounted on styrene, gator board, masonite with the hanging hardware directly on the back, and it can be hung right up in the gallery. Um, I'm gonna go past the print surfaces. Um, Fuji has changed some of their papers. One of their papers, it was a, I think it might be this one. If you've got some vivid colors and lots of contrast, the metal look can be really stunning if you're printing on the paper. Anyway, um, you can get protective coatings once again in a gallery, the luster is, is better. Um, if you want textures, that's totally up to you. They have, <laughs> You know, people really into photography know what silver halide prints are. Uh, and 
the amazing thing here is it, you can have it up to 610 DPI. So if you're printing large, but it's something where people are going to come up close to look, then high DPI can be useful. If you're printing large, but people are going to be 10 feet away, uh, going up to that high a DPI is not going to make much difference. Most prints are at between 200 and 300 DPI. I aim for 300 DPI. Um, lots of mounting options. This is a smooth plastic. Um, let's see, where are the Gator phone? See here, very simple mounting hardware, but this particular one does not have a hook in the middle. And generally, whether you have a wire or some kind of opening here in the middle makes for easy hanging. If you end up with something that has two holes at the end, you'll need to figure out a way to possibly string a wire between the two so it can be hung in the middle on uh, the Sebastopol Gallery's equipment. Masonite's another good option. Of course, they get more expensive as you go up. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the gallery encourages black frames with white matting, uh, but it's encouraged. When you make a print, you're going to have to live with it and keep it. If you print simply on a board with a hanger, it's easy to store away. If you're like me, I have very limited wall space and I have to rotate things. I can't keep it all up on the wall. Um, so for example, if you click on any of these, you can see examples of how it will look. When ordering, you can also see more. Um, then you get to sizes and prices. And for like in a gallery, let's say you did, I don't know, um, eight, but let's see, that's one by three, let's see, one by two, et cetera. You can find all, all the standard sizes. But basic luster print, you can see, you can get an eight by 24, eight by three print. These are pretty inexpensive. Um, well, you can see when you start going, you know, up to the high ends, well, not too big a difference. Um, then, now, oh, Something I'm doing for the exhibition is 30 by 30. All right. And if you notice, the, the basic luster 30 by 30 is $71. And I'll sort of remember that because I'm going to show an alternative. Um, it's actually less after the initial investment. Um, And you can see, you can get, you know, really big prints, but that gets pricey. And those are not mounted on board. This is just no, the print. This is just the print. Right. Now, it says economy, no color correction. It Color correction is so inexpensive. And in my experience, no matter how many times I think I have it just exactly the way I like it, if I don't take color correction indoors, it's too dark. So, um, 
anyway. What is color correction exactly? Well, they cover, let's see if I can find, find the spot that explains. There's a spot along the way and I'll highlight it when it comes up. Um, so, here's you know, black styrene or gator foam. Generally, these can be good. Um, if you want it a little nicer, you get a little wider frames on it. So, going up to say, um, uh, I'm trying to trying to find a fairly standard size two two by three ten by fifteen is two by three and you can see to have it mounted on the board mm -hmm. um what is it uh, eleven dollars so we're now getting up around you know, twenty, twenty-five dollars. Get something ready for a gallery. And to do it, it's very simple online. And for example, um, let's see if I can find. Thirty by is that thirty by thirty? Yeah. So I ordered this, but in a different place. Thirty by thirty. Your image gets put up there, and then you're able to, if you know, you want to fill it out a little more. You can't shrink it, but you can move it around a little to fit it on the print. Uh, this is a square option. If it's a portrait or landscape, there'll be a button here so you can flip it and take a look. Um, then underneath, you get your surface uh, choices. Um, and then you get your choices of the you know, what you want to mount it on. And so this one's very basic. Uh, so let's say I, if I were to go with Gator Foam. Oh, that's, what do we got here? And so very often it's the mounting and the framing more than the print, which is your cost. And that's where 30 by 30 uh, is probably about twice the area of most exhibition prints. So figure your cost could be um, half or less than what you're seeing there. And then if you were to add it to the cart, uh, how did I get two things in my cart? Oh, somehow I got a toy. Um, trying to remember which is which here. Oh, apparently I added it twice. So anyway, you can always remove it. And here's the color collection thing. And let's see. Do can I expand that? Uh, let's see. Okay. We hand adjust each image for density, color, contrast, and saturation for the best prints possible. Uh, fortunately, in the exhibition, there will be exhibition lighting. Um, realize when you get it home and if you don't have exhibition lighting it's going to look darker uh, 
in my experience, uh, truly, I go with color correction. Otherwise, when I bring my prints home, they're too dark. So that's just my personal experience there. Okay. Okay. Then for comparison, and let me shrink this back down. Oh, I didn't want to go that far. Let's see. Okay. When you're up in this area, you can pick different products. Um, and for example, um, also, be careful. If you change product lines, you lose what you've been doing. Anyway, I've been using, we have a system called Exposer, which, um, there's 30 by 30, there it is. And let's see. There we go. This exposure system, it's a print on a sort of vinyl substrate, and it has this stretchable bar that the corners of the print hook into the corners of this frame. And what it allows you to do is once you have the frame, you can order what are called exchange prints. They're just the prints without this. And so you can, once again, like me, if you have limited wall space, you can switch the print that's actually changing and very little storage to keep them. Um, now, for the exhibition, I'm trying to, I think I needed something like this to hang onto the hardware at, what was it? Um, not Finley. Yeah, it was Finley. Or was it Steel Lane? Well, Finley was where I, I hung my yeah. exposure prints. Mm -hmm. Steel Lane was a framed metal print. And they've added a new surface, which gets a lot better dark. So I'm interested to see that. Anyway, um, to compare prices on that, um, and, Oh, wrong product. Um, not exposure, but the exchange print, which is without the frame. And wow. So it's pretty good. You can get big prints for a lot less. Let's see, that was 30 by 30, um, 20 by 20. No, um, two by three, 16 by 24, and even 16 by 16. So if you like printing and showing things and exhibiting things, this can be a way to not run out of room to store these things and they're very portable. So if you're going to an exhibition, street fair or something and you want to display it, it's a nice option. What's their turnaround time, Steve? Um, let me, let's see, I've got, I think I had that up on a page. Not that. Of course, it's hiding behind my, my Zoom 
thing. There we go. Okay. So print some under 30 inches, uh, two business days. Um, but if you do something like you get, where is it? A framed metal print, five to 12 days. Most things are, I mean, five to six days or less. Uh, shipping options, overnight, two day and standard shipping. Uh, so you wanna make sure that if you're preparing for the exhibition, no, you'll upload um, the digital image to the exhibition committee who will select, then they will give you an announcement. And if you haven't printed it, let's see. Can someone tell me what that date was for when the choices are announced? I think it's like mid-September mid or? Uh, right, well, the <laughs> end of October uh, submissions should be in. Uh, I have to go look at the uh, yeah. date, but yeah, shortly after that. Yeah, the <laughs> uploads close the end of August and it would probably be mid-September. And when do we start hanging? Uh, well, we hang, the show opens on the 22nd of October. So it's that, it's that week. Um, it, yeah, uh, probably Tuesday of that week. There's another show being hung. So it, uh, we, we'll coordinate with that so that everything is exactly the same. Thing. What, what I'm figuring is you'll have just, I think just about a month or is it three weeks between the time the selections are made and we go to hang? Oh, a, a month, a good month. Pardon? A month. A month. I would say, you know, I, I didn't have any warning about this. I will look at my spreadsheet of dates. Steve, I have a question. Um, sure. Are you able to uh, do any size are you, or are you constrained to their sizes? Can you do um, your own crop dimensions with that, the system that they are, that you've been uh, talking about? Well, let me bring the screen back up again. And <clears throat> if you need help with it, I, I figured a whole lot out about how to best fit your image to a preset size. Um, let's see, let's see. Mm -hmm. preset, then you can't do your own. Uh, yes, thing. the short answer to that is yes, you can do it. They vote up, they have a special selection area. Oh, wrong one. Okay, good. So you can do your own uh, yep. cropping. Uh, okay, cool. I use, I use they vote a lot, and I've been very happy with them. Mm. Okay, and their shipping is usually one day because we are so close. Come in from, from Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. oh. I have, Steve, I have my, my list of dates mm -hmm. in front of me. So the 29th is the date to submit and of August. And then um, I have, I, these are a bit rough, but the 19th of September, we select the images and the 20th inform the members of the selected works. And, and then, so that's a full, almost a month before we install. So I have the, uh, the 18th, we bring the artwork in and the 19th we install of October. So we have a good bit of time. And while I'm speaking, I, I wanted to say a couple things that as far as the black frames, that's not the gallery's, the gallery has nothing to say, it's us. And I had suggested that it does not have to be black frames and it 
can be any other kind of hanging mechanism. And the one you showed, Steve, um, it, sometimes there's a bar that you screw onto the wall and then the, there's a mechanism that hangs from that. And that's perfectly fine. I, just about any, I'm sure any of these framing mechanisms we can deal with. The only thing we really don't like are those little sawtooth thingies that you can't get the piece to hang straight. You know what I mean? <laughs> On the cheapy frames you buy, they have those little sawtooth hangers. Oh yeah. Good. Now, what, what was the question that I brought this back for to answer? It was already answered. Already answered? Yeah. Okay. So, stop sure. Yeah, it had to do with the dimensions, that you could do any kind of dimension. Oh, it's because, let me go back, because and you download that and it's actually easier using the app than going through their website. Well, rather than taking up too much time, let you all know if, for example, you have an odd size and when you go to select, there isn't a size that fits. Uh, whether you're in Photoshop, Affinity Photo or something, um, you take not your document size, but your canvas size and expand it to the size um, that's your target to print on. Then you place your photo in a layer over that and you position over it. You, for example, um, the base layer, fill layer, it could be black or some other color, which sort of creates a mat or frame around it. But you can then, dragging the corners, not a center side, but the corners proportionally change the size of the image against that background. Excuse me. <coughs> um, and that way you can pick the best size and price that you want to print on and you can resize your image to optimally fit that size. Uh, Steve, I don't think you have to do that. I know I have in the past, I believe, worked with them, and I do really odd sizes that I choose, and I want to keep it like that, and I believe that that's what Pat's saying, and I think I heard Tim say yes, that he also experienced you can do that, so I believe that you just pay whatever the high, the whatever higher. it fits onto, it may be smaller, but that's the size you pay. And I believe that's the case. And I understand why Pat wants to do that because that's what I always want to do. Right. Uh, if you're like me, I like Thank you. <laughs> to fit it the way I optimally want it because it may fit, but there may be more width or not. Um, but I haven't tried it. They'll cut it to the size that you want. It doesn't have to be yeah. one of the standard it, sizes. I is, think that's what Pat says that she wants, and, and I have done that in the past. Is it a custom price, though? No, I believe, uh, again, I haven't done this in the last few years, but the price that I paid was whatever it fit into. So. Ah, okay. That sounds good. And, and Tim, was that what you said? Yes. Also, they have one of the best customer service people I've worked with. They really help. And I always do this. I ask if they've got any discounts going on. And they usually give me a 10% discount. All right. 
So apparently we all agree Bay Photo is a good vendor. Yes. So anyway, I'm done. I'm done. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate it. For those of us who've never Thank done you, this. <laughs> Thank you. One other thing I'd like to add to this, if I may, is make sure that when you're working with the images in Lightroom or Photoshop, that you're working with as a, as a, whatever it is, not the, not the high-end one that Photoshop allows you to use. Is if you do it, throws off no color on your images. That may not make any sense, but I'm going to find that information. We've done a lot of our own framing, you know, um, for pictures. So that's what Fritz and I have done. Um, he he mats them and and um, we we buy our frames and make them. So. So we've done in the past, but I'll try them. I'll look into them. Okay. Thank you much. <laughs> now we move on to um, John Burgess's funny video. Sure we will. Okay, let me know if you can hear the sound. Okay, photojournalism. Can you hear the 59? sound? Yep. Yeah. Um, hey, you like the smell of that? I like it too. So this week is a little different in my food shoot because um, of the COVID. So it's going to be a little unusual, but I thought it'd be great because it's pretty much like what you guys are going to do at home. So what I have here is a, a collection of uh, the frozen foods that are delivered to seniors uh, by the um, series project in Sebastopol. So they have a, a huge kitchen and an enormous number of people that they help out and deliver these meals to. And so they've, they've, uh, we're doing a story on these frozen meals. And so I had to dethaw them. I had to, they gave me containers for them, but they're not, you know, this is the, uh, this is the salmon chowder that we're gonna try to shoot here in just a second. Uh, a little goopy, I'm gonna have to heat that up and make sure it looks good. Uh, the noodles for a beef stroganoff that's that's on the stove now. I'm probably not going to show you that shoot because it's going to look pretty bad. There, it's sort of just gooey, gray in meatballs. And then I have some pickled onions. And the chef gave me a, a, a some some greens and some chives and parsley to put on top to add color. Um, normally, I'm working with a chef, and we're doing it either at the restaurant or at their home. And sometimes that's difficult because you don't know what the light is. With John Ash, we have this system. I wish I could show you John Ash, um, one of his shoots, but he has a back door with a piece of glass on it. And so I can move that glass and, it, and it, if I move the door, at, we figured out 11 in the morning is the best time for this, that I can move the door and it reflects the light back onto my food that I'm putting down on the ground at the base of that door. So I'm just standing up over it, which is a lot easier than getting a ladder. And honestly, I'm just not a very good food stylist. So mine are usually pretty simple and all about um, color and uh, texture. So I try to play off the colors of the food that I'm uh, going for. So in this case, I'm choosing all my own stuff from my own house. Uh, so um, what I decided to do is the salmon is in sort of a grayish, um, it's a chowder, so it's kind of gray behind it. And then, so the salmon is sort of that pink red. So I'm gonna go with pink red because um, he gave me these pickled onions that I think go with that. And then I decided that I want them to pop. If I put them in a white bowl, it wouldn't be very interesting. So I have a black piece of tile. And I went to a tile store and I said, you know, hey, I'm a food photographer. Um, could I buy one of your samples of your tiles, the biggest one you got? And so I got a big towel and they just usually give them to me. I hit up like three or four stores and I got white ones and that. And as you know, I've created a bunch of my own backgrounds and I'll show you those at the end of the video. Okay, in my house, I have a couple different really great windows. I have this giant bay, but it kind of disperses the light a lot. So you don't have a sharpest light 
And unfortunately, we're on an overcast day, but I have to complete this assignment today. So since I'm shooting uh, down on this food, I'll show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come over here, and I'm just going to open my front door. What's great is if you have a, a, a door that's glass, so the glass can sometimes reflect back in. Um, what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to take this light stand, oops, and I'm going to attach it here, and then I'm going to place it outside the door. So you guys see out here, there's, there's daylight out here. I'm a little late in the day for this, but unfortunately, um, so normally I'd like to put my reflector here, and I clip it here, and it reflects back in as the light shoots this way. Since I'm later in the day, I'm going to have to bring it out here and put it uh, as close as I can. And this will give me a little bit of reflection. You see how that works? So if I, it's easier if it's closer. The bigger the light source, that's good too. Or sometimes you just need a little one. But it reflects in just a tiny bit of cool light, you know, a, a nice reflection. We're, again, we're a little bit late in the day, but I got to do it now. So let's go to it. Okay, uh, in this shoot we have one little problem. The, uh, the chef from the series project didn't give me enough of his, his fermented onions to fill my massive black bowl. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use just two colors in this shoot. So I wanna use this bowl, but since we don't have enough onions, this is a trick that I use and um, there are tons of these online. Um, as I said, I'm not really a food shooter, but um, what I'm gonna do is, Sort of make this little platform here just a little bit smaller than the inside of my bowl. And then um, it looks a little tall, so I'm just going to push it down a little bit more. There we go. And then I'm going to put my onions on top. I should have probably just cut some more of my own onions to make them. But now we can spread them out. And again, um, we're going to fill it every corner. And if they don't quite fill every corner, if you see a little bit of this silver, um, you're going to be okay because, you know, it's, it's food shoot, it's photo, you, know, you can Photoshop a little bit in a food shoot, even if you're a photojournalist. So anyway, that's how I sort of uh, make that dish come up to speed there or come up to height so that the light will hit it correctly. All right. All right. So I can, uh, I can bring this in and style all the food down or I, what I've done is I've gone ahead and styled it because it's on just a little tiny black tile. So I have this this pattern here that's all just two colors. I'm playing off the salmon and the, the red onions and then I have a red handled spoon here and uh, against the black bowls, the black tile, and actually a black uh, handkerchief. So only two colors. Okay you see so it's it's in the direct light there and so to finish it off I just want to splash a color so I'm going to put some chives. I'm just going to randomly toss chives because in a soup like this it's pretty boring it's only you see the salmon I've made sure to bring the salmon right to the top of the dish and then I'm gonna sprinkle these chives around maybe a little parsley just to give it some color and there we go I make sure my spoon is in a good position and pretty much I'm pretty much in frame aren't I um, basically, I have two choices for my lenses here. Uh, I have a 55 macro. A regular 50 will do. A 50 is good. And I try to use the longest lens I can to get in there. Um, so luckily for me, the brand new 70 to 200s from Canon focus really close. And uh, I can stand up and maybe be on my tippy toes a little bit and get this all in focus. So here's how I shoot it. Okay, I'm shooting it at, um, I'm trying to shoot at a pretty, um, at the smallest aperture I can while still hand holding this lens. So I'm going to feel comfortable, maybe about a, since I'm shooting at 70, about a 1 25th of a second. So as long as I keep it there, I should be good and everything should be in focus. Um. <laughs> A little too dark, so I'm going to open it up a little bit. Good. Okay. 
And then to make sure, I actually take my 55 and I shoot it too. And I close down even more just to make sure I have enough the depth that I want. <coughs> And the key is to be directly over the bowl. If you're off a little bit this way or this way, you feel as though the camera's going to be falling over. So you'll find that you can't even turn it upside down, that there's only one direction that it works correctly. And then I refocus a lot and I keep shooting. And now I'm going to just take some of the, the onion and I'm just going to toss it on the board. I'm going to take maybe some of the chive and toss it on just to add another Im layer of the image. I'm not very good at this part. There's professional stylists that really know their, their world here. Um, if you get to something like Bon Appetit or those, the photographer actually has a food stylist and a prop stylist. So somebody for just the plates and the dishes and somebody for the food. I've only worked with a stylist once and they got paid a lot more than I did for the shoot, actually. So we'll try that one. I like that one. I think it's going to be the winner. The little, the little chives add a lot to it. Uh-oh, i got to cross them. i got to do something there. There we go. So I'm shooting a lot, you see. And what I find is just various changes in the photo is going to make a huge difference. That one of these is going to peek out from the rest of them and say, I'm the one that you need to pick. So you see, this is my view from above. Um, and as you see, as I move back here, it looks like I'm falling over. And as I move forward, I'm falling the other direction. So I want to be directly above it there. And again, you may end up cropping or doing something like that. Okay, so I showed you guys how to use the floor uh, and a door, which is my preferred method, so I don't have to stand on anything. But let's have a look. If you're going to use a window, say the light doesn't work in your doors, or they're covered, or they don't really have much light coming through them, then I'd use a window, right? So first I have this giant bay, and I'm just going to, here's my vegetables that are here. Oh, actually, these are flowers that are growing. Um, but do you see when you look down on this that it's pretty flat light because this bay window gives me um, three sides instead of just one. So usually if I use this, I'm in the morning. I use it in the morning and the light will hit directly where the flowers are. But then if I come out here, it'll bounce and hit indirectly. So I usually use like this little table if I'm going to use this giant window. Um, oops, there it is again. But it works great for all sorts of things. It's a great window um, for that three-quarter lighting or portraiture. It's great. Okay, looking around my house, I have this window too. But you notice that this window has, um, there's an overhang up there. So it doesn't get, it, the light's going to be pretty dim using this window and not very directional. So I'm going to avoid this window if I can. Okay, and now coming in here to the office, uh, we have another window and it's pretty good. But let's go look at, see what's happening at this time of the day. Uh, at this time of the day, as you see, the light's coming through and it's, it's harsh and uh, direct right now. Uh, in another two hours, uh, this light's going to be really nice. And then actually, it's going to be coming in, um, it's going to hit uh, this side of the window because the, the sun is setting that way. And so later, it's going to not hit the inside. But then if I also put that white kicker card on the outside, it's going, and I angle it back in, it's going to give me an extra little glow. But I have to wait a couple hours for this photo. So, um, you know, you see you don't want that direct light. Actually, I'm going to take that back. Sometimes you do want the direct light, and it can look really good with direct light. Um, I prefer a softer light for food myself. Finally, in a... 
in the big TV room here, you have um, a window that's uh, got some directional light. It's a, it's a south facing or north facing window, so it'll never get direct light. The problem is it's pretty soft light once you get down here. So anytime I'm looking at my light source, what I do is I hold my hand flat and that'll kind of give me an idea of what the light source is doing. I'll hold it up, you know, to the side, like if I'm checking the light here, oops, I got to open up a little bit. Uh, I'll just hold it to the side like a face so that I can see the shadows on my fingers and how they would fall. So I'm constantly just holding my hand up to look at light and see how it's going to fall. So in this case, if I look down here, it's not bad. It's, it's, it's fairly dark, so I'm not going to get a great depth of field unless I put it on a tripod. But this is the best choice of window at this time of day now. Okay, we saw how to use a door, and I like that better because, you know, I can stand up. It's easier for me to deal with the situation. But if all you have is a window, that happens a lot, now, like a restaurant, if I'm shooting in a restaurant, then I don't want to, I can't block the door uh, while I'm shooting. So usually I'm using a window in a restaurant and using either a chair or a stool. Usually I ask for a stool. Um, but again, this is my best window. It's an indirect light source. Um, I brought in a table. Now the table has to get you up to the height of the window. Again, you can't have this, if you go below the height of the window, if I showed you with my hand, you know, my hand demonstration earlier, if I dropped it lower, and maybe I'll reshoot it, um, that uh, it, we'd lose the light. So this is what you want a table set up. Um, I'm just going to use this little blue uh, piece, but you can just use a, a tablecloth or something like that in your photo if you can't figure out a fun surface. So, uh, of course, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to need to bring in a chair. And for some reason, I like to work with it facing backwards because um, that way, as I, as I lean over the image, because remember, I have to be over the middle of that bowl that's there. I just got a bowl of cereal here. Um, I know I had one student who um, was saying, do I have to cook? Uh, ah, shoot a bowl of cereal. Just make sure it has some texture in it if you if you want. But you know you get to choose what you want to shoot uh, for the first part of it. But uh, let's have a look. So I'm going to get up on a chair. Or actually, uh, so what I'd have to do is get way up here, and because I'm up here, I can't use my 70 millimeter lens. So I'm going to use a 55, my 55 here. So a 50 millimeter lens is really good for a window like this. And then you just want to make sure that you, you have a very sturdy chair or a sturdy um, uh, a little ladder, okay? Because uh, you just don't put yourself in a, in a dangerous situation. Make sure you're stable the whole time, too. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I'm in the same kind of situation. The light's coming in and, and cascading over the bowl. I'll show you what it looks like in just a second. But I also have a little clamp here that I set up. And so sometimes I can just use my knees to hold the white kicker card if I'm going to use that against the, against the table. Or in this case, I do have this, uh, this clamp so I can bring it in. I'm going to move the chair out for a second. And with this, I can bring this up and you can see uh, the variation. So as I come up, it adds more and more light to the bowl. So I can decide, oh, I only want just a little bit. So again, that's why I varied the size in that previous shoot at the door. But with this one, I can hide it down underneath the table. And when I like it, I just um, get my clamp to work right. And I clamp it into place. And so then that's going to give me my little kicker light. And let's have a look at what that light looks from above. When I first started, everybody was shooting from the side and they were tilting the camera so the plate the food always looked like it was falling off the plate. So styles change over time. Um, so as a professional, you have to adapt to what's happening there. But again, this simple uh, light source is going to get you a nice, clean, simple image pretty much every time. So just to reinforce the description in the, the assignment, um, the way I shoot this is I want the most depth of field for a down shot as I possibly can get. So that means um, I set the camera 
to its highest ISO where I feel the quality is still good enough for reproduction. So I usually keep it in the maybe, I try to get 800 and maybe 1250, but I don't go above 1250 for food. So if that's my highest ISO, I simply set it to my camera uh, shutter speed to the um, shutter speed that I know I can handhold. So in this case, if I use a 50 millimeter lens, I'm pretty comfortable at 60th of a second or 80th of a second. So if I set my camera to 60th or 80th of a second, then not all I do now is I is I dial down my f-stop. So if I hopefully I can get 8 f8 or something like that, or even more. So I dial it down till it's the correct exposure. And um, let's say it's it's f8. Um, you know that's the most depth of field I can get without putting it on a tripod. Uh, which is really tough from shooting above, but people have setups for it who do only food photography. Um, so they have a tripod that goes over over the meal. Um, or the only other thing we can really do is kick up our ISO to get to get more depth of field, and we we don't want to kick up our ISO ISO higher than twelve fifty in this case. Okay, so um, there are dozens and dozens of different ways to shoot food, of course. You know, there's artificial light, uh, and people do use this light from the side. There's lots of different ways of doing it. I'm just showing you one technique, and, and to me, this is the most simple way of doing it, and the most elegant. The light is always beautiful coming from this window. Um, and you can actually, if you back up, you can shoot from the side in the same position at more of a 45 degree angle. So especially like meat where there's some glow and there's highlights all over it, usually I get a little lower and I'm shooting maybe from a 45. In these images, I'm using a heavy reflector card in the front to fill in as much as I possibly can. But for now, let's just try this technique straight down because it is the style that's in right now. Um, pretty much every blog is using down. If you look at magazines, everybody's shooting down right now. Um, and it makes life a lot easier to manipulate the items in the photo too, it turns out, than shooting from the side. Okay, just a little um, reinforcement on what it says in the assignment. But basically, what you want here is the most depth of field uh, you can get for the down shot. You know, I want to see my little raisins in focus on, on the board. So, um, in order to do that, I set my ISO to the highest it can go while still giving me good enough quality for reproduction. So, in the newspaper, 800 or 1250 is a good figure for a ballpark for me that I'm shooting and I'm trying to get 800 um, out of it. And then at that point, um, I determine what lens I'm using. So uh, from above in this shot, I'm using a 50, a 55. So I feel comfortable hand holding that at 60th of a second. Now I do take multiple images. I think you saw at the door that I'm gonna take I'm going to take dozens of images and I'm going to refocus a lot because you'll find that, that even though you're shooting the same thing over and over again, there's this one image as you move across that's going to pop from the rest. So once you set uh, the ISO and you determine your shutter speed, now all you have to do is uh, get over the image and set the correct f-stop and uh, so it should be nicely saturated. Usually I go even a third or half stop under and bring it back with food. So I, in post I make it a little bit brighter but I want that that texture and depth of color you get when you underexpose a little bit. Um, so once I've determined the correct exposure, that's the maximum amount of depth of field that I'm going to get. The only way to change that depth of field would be to increase the ISO, and I don't want to do that. Uh, so that's how you set the camera, and uh, have at it. I mentioned that at uh, Bon Appetit or, or one of the big magazines that there'll be a prop stylist and a food stylist. and. Um, 
Uh, but most food shooters work with another food stylist, except for newspapers, typically. Bloggers would do, be, do their own styling, too. I start with just a simple thing. So I shoot just the bowl first. I typically take uh, do this in stages. And then I add things. So the first thing I'm going to add are just the extra raisins off to the side. And they want to be kind of randomized. So you don't, you, you kind, of, kind of just toss them and um, hope they land in an interesting spot. One's hiding behind a little bit. Ooh, as I move on the chair, I saw my tripod shake. Um, there you go, uh, that's not bad. And then I take a few shots with just raisins around the outside. Second, you know, I can add my spoon. I can put it this side, I can throw it to the other side. Oh, would you stop focusing um, that sound you hear? I'm gonna turn it to, there you go. Turn it to manual focus now so that you don't hear the autofocus trying to do its thing. Uh, so then I'd shoot a few with the spoon in it too, and maybe the spoon at different angles, or, you know, maybe it's on top with a few in. Maybe I put a raisin in the, oops, I missed that completely. I put a raisin on top, maybe that works out better. Um, next, you know, again, what I've done is I've got a blue bowl here. It's a weird blue bowl I made in uh, ceramics class at the junior college. Um, uh, but So I'm sticking with that same color scheme. So the two colors we have here basically are the blue of the bowl. I'm going to get off of the, the chair now. Um, the blue of the bowl and then the, uh, the grain itself, the cereal itself, is kind of a yellowish color. So let's try to pick up on that. So I, I have, I do have, I don't have any blue napkins, but I do have a yellow napkin. So maybe I'd try that, you know, with a spoon on it. Now there are these, these stylists can get these napkins absolutely perfect. I don't know how they do it. I'm, I'm terrible at it. But usually I just grab a point to it and then go there. And then I, I organize my spoon uh, in different ways in the shot. Uh, you know, I could toss it up there, you know, like this. Uh, again, you know, it's, it's have a look between each frame and see what you like. But then when you get back to edit, you'll have tons of different uh, variations on the theme. And you may decide that yellow is just too much. Or gosh, if I, if I had only like even, you know, draped the whole thing in yellow, you know, maybe that works. I'm not sure. Uh, looks a little bright to me but you guys decide but you got to decide if you have uh, if you do these options so quickly build up to uh, to the image that you like and then um, and then you'll have the options along the way okay and once again let's just show you a little bit about how that kicker card works so this is no kicker card and then as you lift the um, the reflector that's the sound of it lifting it can only lift as high as the the, the tripod, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to shove it down uh, faster. So here it is with a, a full fill, and then there it is without. So once again, this is what you're going to do. You're going to fill it, and then not. So you need two images for this assignment. You need one that's your perfect image from above, and then you need one with that little fill card in it, okay? Part of the food shoot requires you to choose a particular subject, in this case, mushrooms, and just shoot a single object. So here's tomatoes, uh, cut them apart, see what they look like inside, all that's good. Um, in this case, uh, I needed to do a story on how to use uh, edible flowers, and I just created the pattern that goes around the type. Uh, I'm showing you here a few I got off the web just for fun. You know, just have some fun with it. It doesn't have to be stayed or, or it could be ridiculous as in this case. Or you can just do it really simply uh, like this kiwi here. Just shoot it, you know, super tight and you're okay. Um, also, uh, you know, you can pick like eggs here or blueberries. You can add another element just to highlight the blueberries. You know, there are no strict rules here. Also, I'd like to talk about color. You know, just, you know, make sure you choose the right colors here. I'm playing off the reds and the greens of the sushi, and in this case, the purple of the dyed eggs or the beet eggs. 
with a purple couch that's behind it. I found a purple couch in the place. In this case, you know, you're playing with the green, with the green background and the flowers with the hummus that's beet flavored. Okay, you guys, let's move that out of the way. Okay, we're here in the living room studio, the living room food shoot studio. And um, first I wanna to talk to you a little bit about surfaces. And so those are the key to food shooting now because it's all down. So you're gonna see what's behind them. So as you saw in my car, um, I have a bunch of different surfaces. And a lot of them are on just pieces of wood and I've added some texture and then I've just painted them. You know, way too complicated for what you guys are doing and I'm getting paid as a professional. But we can find other surfaces everywhere and it really doesn't, it doesn't matter too much. You know, hopefully you find a cool one. But let me just show you some of mine and maybe some of the pictures that uh, I took with them. This is one I made recently. It's just really simple white and we used it for the, uh, the meatballs tonight. That's what those look like. Uh, this is a red. I've only used it once or twice as sort of a background. It looks a little, I think I went a little overboard on the color here. Um, but maybe this would work for, uh, for like an individual piece of, uh, of, of food. So if you're doing a story on just one item, like uh, I'll show you later, asparagus or blueberries or something like that, okay? Um, next we have just, I went to um, a reclaimed wood place in Petaluma and bought a $16 board and cut it down and made this one. It's just a redwood fence. But then on the back, I painted it sort of white underlayment and then different shades of blue on the top. Um, so let me show you a shot with the blue. Great. And then um, here's a, here's, I do, I use this one a lot because it's so simple. So here's a, here's a few shots with this. Okay, I went, uh, I think I found this at a, at a used store or something like that. It's just an auto pan liner and it's uh, for oil and everything. And a, a woman who was a, who works for the Press Democrat sometimes as a writer uh, has used, has one of these and has used them on the covers of many books that she's produced. So I went out quickly and, and found one of mine. This one's got a little schmutzy because it's been, uh, it's been in the car a bit. Uh, but I used it for asparagus, so here's a, here's how I shot asparagus. So you do have part of your assignment is to shoot a single item of food, like, you know, it could be onions, it could be kiwi, anything excite, that excites you. So I did this uh, asparagus, and I put, tied up, found a little twine and tied it around them, and I painted this background specifically for that, so we could float type where it says, uh, where, in the, in the dark blue, we could float type in it. Oh yeah, and on the back side, again, they're two-sided, they're made of wood. And this one I like a lot, it's textured. Um, I don't know if you can see the texturing on it, uh, but I'll show you a couple examples here. This one is an old Model T. Um, the back door for that flips up to sit in the back. Uh, but I find that using even the handles and little pieces here, Make quite an interesting photo. So here are a couple examples of that. And then today you'll see that I'm uh, I'm using a black tile. And these are those tiles I was talking about that I sort of scammed out of the tile places. And they don't care. They have a bunch of these samples that are given to them. So they're free anyway. Uh, they get a little scuffed up when I put them in the back of the car, so I keep them in the garage now. But um, they, they don't, they're not big enough for a lot of stuff, but they, they're, they're okay, they'll work. Um, but also, if I just look, oh, I got one more biggie back here. So here, this is one I use, uh, again, it's just a piece of cedar, ah, cedar fencing. Whoa, nearly hit my glass table. Um, and it's bigger for different items. So I, I actually bought this and made this for specifically for a squash shoot last winter. So here's that squash shoot. And finally, I'm just look, I just looked over there right now and I saw that I had sort of a, it's a piece of marble tabletop. It's a little complicated for food, but maybe it'd work. I think it'd work fine. And I could put this on the ground too. So look around your house, you might, it could be anything. You see there, I've got an oil pan and, a, um, and an old malty piece, so an old rusted piece. Uh, John Ash uses uh, doors from Marrakesh. Here's that one. That one's super cool. And anything that looks sort of old and funky works.
Thanks, John. <laughs> John. He's so hilarious. Really fun. <laughs> I love it when he's not even in the picture. His head's being cut off. He's still talking away. He sent a couple other ones. If I, I mean, should just send them to the club, and you could look at them if you want on different subjects. But kind of fun, quirky. Yeah. <laughs> so now we we get a um, uh, take on food photography from Mike. Mike Funk. Well, uh, I wish I had seen that video before I've shot the photos that you're about to see. <laughs> uh, I've, most I've of seen. them, I took quite a few of these back in 2018 and uh, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I found out how difficult good food photography really is. It's not easy. Uh, so he had some really good ideas there, especially the surfaces and the backdrops. Uh, I found that I was looking all over the place in my house to try and find things that I could use, as you'll see. So if uh, Steve, however, I have to share my screen here. Just Can click, that or click on the share screen at the bottom of your screen. Share screen. Do, do, do. Share screen. Um, okay, I think that's what I want right there. Okay, do you see the coffee beans? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Um, the coffee beans, I took this photograph with, uh, I think there's about 60 images here. Uh, and I used uh, Helicon Focus, I believe the name of the program was, to uh, try and get them all into uh, focus, at least in the front. I probably could have used another 20 frames to get the whole thing in, but I, I liked it. It was a lot of fun. So let me see if I can. Michael, can you make it full screen? Uh, let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Uh, I think yes, green I button. green hold button on. on top left at the top. Yeah. Left, green. All right, hold on. on. I'm going to hit play. Maybe it'll do that. Is that better? There you go. Right. Now, if yep. I click, it should go to the next one, hopefully. Yeah, there you go. Uh, food photography doesn't have to always be set up like John was doing in the video. You can go out to farmers markets and find some good photographs. Uh, these onions actually kind of caught my eye. And so I, I, uh, I photographed them and put sort of a matte finish on them. And I, I think it's attractive. And uh, food can be pretty exciting if you want to take photographs of it. Carrots. Beautiful purple. At a, <laughs> at a farmer's market. And uh, you can bring out the detail a lot with uh, Aurora HDR. Mm -hmm. uh, try not to go overboard, but. Uh, you really bring out the detail in the food. It's pretty amazing. So that's what I did with this particular one. They look like they're hugging. Yeah, <laughs> they are friendly carrots. <laughs> uh, I love strawberries. They're fun to oh. photograph. And you, you don't need to do any extraordinary setups. You can just do it something like this. I think makes a really nice photograph. Uh, they look pretty darn good, too. I'm ready to eat some. <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the things he talked about was the, the surface, the back surface. This was a gray tile I had around the house and I uh, tried various combinations of things I had, uh, fruits and whatnot, and it was fun. And, and they turned out really good on the gray background. So you can use old tiles. I used cutting boards. I used uh, uh, wall boards uh, that you'll see in a little while. These are sort of uh, just candid photos during mealtime. Uh, I happen to like lamb chops. So uh, I did the lamb chops and the broccolini, just happened to take a picture of it. It looked pretty nice. So I thought I'd take a photo. Uh, and then a, uh, a flank steak, I think that was, uh, sitting on a cutting board with the utensils. So I don't know if you can see the whole thing because I'm seeing you people over the onions, I think. So can you see the? Yes, yes we see it all. Okay. Three compositions. Yeah. Uh, here's a couple of different ones. I happen to like bagels and lox. So one day I was getting ready to have breakfast and I said, I'm going to photograph this because the colors were great. So like you said, you know, you find some props. So I found a napkin and uh, various uh, cutting boards. And uh, the bottom actually is uh, a couple of pieces of flooring that I had in the garage. Now, the one on the right, I just took that a week ago or so, 
And the reason I did was I liked the onions. So the onions just seem to stand out on that photograph. So I threw it in here because it's food. Other than that, really doesn't have anything to do with how to set up food photography, but I liked it. <laughs> uh, I happen to carry a camera a lot and oftentimes go to a restaurant. And I'll, this was a Reuben sandwich I had. And it can be fun experimenting with depth of field. The one thing I found with food photography is that every little thing that oftentimes can go wrong well. So for instance, I didn't notice that at the time, but there's a little piece of uh, corned beef laying in front of the sandwich there. I would have been better without it and I, I could have removed it, but it was too late after I put it on the slide. So, uh, you know, if there's a problem with the food, you'll find it after you shoot it. When you put it on the computer, you'll find the imperfections and the mistakes that you could go back uh, if you wanted to shoot it all over again. Fingerprints on glasses, things like that. It, it really takes time to do it well. And I've made my share of mistakes. Making me hungry. <laughs> yeah, now these were, uh, I went to a bakery and happened to see this on the left. And I thought, well, let's make a cute photograph. So I happened to buy it, brought it home and had a little flower and just put it together. Mm -hmm. On the right is Trader Joe's candy from some holiday they had. And uh, I put it together with some props, some uh, brass little pictures or whatever they are, and uh, and took the photo. It, it just adds something to it. Very nice. Yes, good color. Uh, if you like morning buns, uh, I took <laughs> this at a bakery just last week. I walked in and asked if I could take some photographs of their stuff in the case and this was one of them and uh you know it, it's just an interesting way to take a do a different take on food uh, this is another shot at the bakery through their glass window uh in the case and then i tried to do a setup uh on my dining room table and i used the uh light through the sliding glass door right next to <laughs> and I used a, a, a black background, uh, you know, those foam, foam core boards that you can buy. I uh, have white ones and black ones in it. And it took a little time, but trying to get the light right. But you can arrange the boards in various ways. You can put a board over the top to help keep the, you know, the extraneous uh, ambient light out. And so this, this is one of my early takes on food photography. I started to get a little bit more oh, okay. adventurous. Nancy made some lemon bars. And uh, here I had an old piece of burlap I put in the back. And this is the, uh, the wall board that I had it left over from a bathroom remodel that I, that I did. And so I put the plate on it and I thought it looked okay with the flowers and the yellow. Uh, and I had Nancy sprinkle the uh, powdered sugar and took a few photographs. Now I'm getting hungry. Action shot. <laughs> uh, I like martinis of type and uh, I just happened to practice on that one. Uh, that I bought a piece of black glass up in Sebastopol and I've been using that in one or two other shots you'll see and it, it, it really helps I think. Uh, the cupcakes were Safeway cupcakes, and uh, I just happened to have that milk container uh, around the house, and I filled it with milk, and I just thought it looked good, and I sprinkled some of the things around the bottom, like uh, he said in his video, like he was doing with the raisins, um, and it kind of adds to the photograph, I think. Great. Uh, this is just when I was out and about in a coffee shop on the left and uh, they had some pastries so I, I I just shot the pastry and you know you can come up with some really nice photographs. Uh, Nancy made some strawberry shortcake one day and I so well, I'm going to see if I can do anything with this and while it's not as good as I had hoped it, it looks pretty good and I ate it afterwards so <laughs> couldn't have been too bad. I like the bright exposure. Yeah something different. Uh, Getting the background white was a bit of a chore, but I, I managed to do it. Uh, most of the time I've used window light. 
Uh, however, recently I've taken some with uh, a flash. I just bought a couple of new uh, lights and started practicing with that and I'll show you. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Do you ever use a gray card? I have a gray card, but I haven't used it. <laughs> I have it in my garage right with all my photo stuff and I have rarely used it, unfortunately. I need to start. Um, here's a photo I had in a competition one time, actually twice. First time didn't do well, second time it did. <laughs> but uh, sprinkling uh, sugar on the strawberries. And here's another one I just did recently. I had Nancy come out and sprinkle some uh, sugar on, on a bowl of strawberries. I happened to find the red uh, bowl around the house. Uh, now this one I used uh, a black background in my garage and I had uh, uh, a soft box with a light and you don't need a fast shutter speed as long as you have a flash exposure. You can freeze pretty much anything even with a slow shutter speed. And I think that's it. So I didn't want to bore you with too many photos. Um, so I don't know what else to tell you. If you have any questions, I'll try and answer them. I'm not an expert at it. I, I'm not a food designer. And if you go to YouTube or Pinterest, you can get some great examples of what you can do. Uh, there's a YouTube video, a gal that I like to follow. Uh, uh, the name is uh, The Bite Shot. Uh, it's a woman that does food photography for a living. She's excellent. Uh, and there's just so many of them uh, that you can, you just Google food photography. You'll be amazed at what you find. Anyway, thanks for letting me have a few minutes. Appreciate it. We really appreciate you. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Something different. And your your sm your uh, smug mug uh, shots your um, that you have oh, on smug. your website are nice too. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Liz saw that. I had some food on my on my website, so I uh, that's how I got talked into this. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, one one thing I will add that I think Tim and Steve said I, I use uh, Bay Photo for my prints, uh, and if you have a Smug Mug account, you can choose which lab you want to do your printing, and I have Bay Photo do mine. And if you have your account, you can save an awful lot of money on prints because your price is a lot better than what uh, anybody else would pay if they just went to the site. So if you're just looking for prints such as eight by tens or 12 by 18s, you can save a lot of money. So just something I thought I'd add to that. And uh, he talked about the exposure prints. I have a couple of them. I have a 30 by 40 and, a, and several uh, 20 by 40s. And like you said, you can replace the print without having to replace the frame and you can save quite a bit of money. Uh, I had one of the prints at the Steel Lane show uh, yes. I had hung up. And so, yeah, the exposure prints are really nice because you can change them out if you get bored with it. Do you store those rolled? Yeah, the roll, they come as a roll and they, they come in a triangle shaped box and, and you just roll them up uh, and, mm -hmm. and put them away. Yeah, I have several. So yeah, they're just sitting there. I, I need to get rid of them, I guess. So, so anyway, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Mike. I'm not too hungry. <laughs> yeah, thank you, not Mike. really after that. Right. Yeah, it's good. I want a pastrami on rye. No. Oh, I had one of those the other day in Sacramento. It was great. All right, how do I get back to you guys? Where's gallery? Unshare. Unshare. Where do I find unshare? The green button. Green button. Yeah, move your cursor to the top of your image. Skip. Enter full screen. Doo -doo. No. No. Oh, you are cool. screen sharing. Okay. Uh, stop share. All right. There we go. Learn something every day. Thank you. That was great. Thanks, yeah, really good. Really yeah. fun. Yeah, I'm inspired. Get out and yeah, do some no, more of that. I've done some, but it's always <laughs> it <is laughs> kind fun. of got away from it. I'd rather shoot food than people. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> that was like Mike says, you can always have that, that strawberry, those nice strawberries yeah. and whipped cream after you're all done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
Nancy does a lot of baking, and so I'm fortunate. I can I can uh, always usually find something to take a photograph of. Yeah, I thought John uh, Burgess is saying about using the window light. I found that works really good for a lot of things. You know, I mean, it does. On our patio, it's an indirect light, and you can use that kicker board, and you can come up with a lot of fun things just without the special lighting. Yeah. Although at times, you know, the flash is helpful, but that's the same thing too. Diffuse light with a flash. And a, and a fill card, and I've done some great things. I don't know if some of you remember when I did the presentation on flash photography, yeah. I was showing examples of that, you know, and it's right. really not that hard to do. Yeah, the, the last shot I did where with the strawberries and the sugar, uh, I had it on, on a table and I had a, fl a new flash unit I bought uh, off to the right side of it, 90 degrees, and I had a big uh, white diffuser that I put in front of the flash. And it really worked very well, it, but the window will do extremely well also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I noticed John Burgess went through his whole house finding the best windows. So I'm <laughs> yeah. Have to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was nice because it kind of showed you that some windows aren't as good as others. And we, uh -huh. you got to think about the time of day and stuff like that. To, you know, some of the little things make a difference, you know. And if your dog's going to come over and try to have some. <laughs> yeah, that was cute, yeah. All right. Good night. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, and Mike and great. Thank and you. Steve. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, have a good Steve. one. Okay, good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.